Hi, Mark Pearson, Executive and Artistic Director of the College Light Opera Company. Welcome to On the Clock, our weekly lecture series. On the Clock is made possible through our partnership with Highfield Hall and a generous grant from the Woods Hole Foundation. This week, music director, composer, and clock alum Andrea Grody is here to talk to us about making a musical from scratch. Let's hear what she has to say. Hello everyone and welcome to Making a Musical from Scratch, How a New Musical Goes from an Idea to Opening Night on Broadway. My name is Andrea Grody. I am a music director. I was most recently the music director of The Band's Visit and Tootsie, which were both Broadway musicals in the past couple of years, composed by David Yazbek. What I want to talk about today are the differences between doing a musical that already exists, where someone hands you a script or a score, and you stage the material that's given to you, and developing a new musical where layer upon layer of decision is made and different elements get added that affect that beginning to end script to score that you eventually get if you're doing a musical like, say, My Fair Lady, that's been around for a while. Back when that show was created, there were people in the room making small changes, making big changes all together, accommodating each other's needs. And I want to look at what it's like for those decisions to get made, how you form complete sequences from beginning to end. I want to start by giving an overview of the process of creating a musical today. We begin with an idea. Most musicals come from the idea that either a writer has or a producer has, sometimes a director. Both of the shows I've worked on were producer-driven projects. The producer of The Band's Visit saw the original movie of The Band's Visit in 2007, and he thought it needed to be on stage and spent a couple of years getting the rights from Iran, who is the screenwriter and filmmaker of The Band's Visit movie. The producer of Tootsie, that movie's been around for a long time, and he wanted to make it a musical and started doing it a number of years ago, actually, that show took a long time to come into fruition. So you have an idea, you get writers, if you aren't already a writer, someone like Lynn manuel Miranda had an idea for his show in the Heights, it was his show, and he was instigating that, and then he added creators from his own side. So once you get to the point where someone has researched and written enough material to hear it, you get to a reading. If you're writing a play, you might imagine that you bring in a script and you hand it to some actors, maybe you've brought your friends in to read the parts for you, and you're all just going to read the script and see how it sounds. A musical is a little bit more complicated because there's music. So you can't just sight read it. Most people don't feel that's a good choice to make. Everyone likes a little bit of time to learn, and some actors don't read music. So the standard industry basic reading is a 29-hour reading. That is the structure determined by Actors Equity, which is the union for actors and stage managers in professional theater. 29 hours is the maximum amount of time you are allowed to have actors available for a particular kind of contract. I'm referencing the industry because I do think it's important to acknowledge the way that the industry and the art form together. Throughout history, patrons of the arts have determined the way that the art is made. If you think about people like Mozart who had patrons who funded their work, the way that we pay for what we're doing is very relevant to the way it gets made. So here we are at our first reading. It's a 29 hour reading. To me, as a music director, that means I've got about a week's worth of work, five days, almost a full work week, 29 hours, where I've got actors in the room. We're going to teach them the score. We're going to read the score. We're going to hear how it sounds. And maybe we're going to do a little bit of work, make some changes. If we want to do more work, we would move into something like a workshop. And the line between readings and workshops is a little bit subtle and is really determined mostly by union contracts. But workshops these days have gotten more and more intense. As Broadway has become more expensive, producers become more risk averse and they want to make sure their show is really ready before they put it up on Broadway. They don't want a show that isn't going to be ready to last that way for a long time. So they do all these developmental phases. So musicals have always had workshops where they've developed ideas, but now it's a much more extensive process. So a workshop might be a two week process that's just a longer reading where you learn the material, you have an opportunity to work with the actors to make more changes and maybe try out some bigger new sequence ideas. And maybe you end up playing around with a little bit of staging or you do very basic staging to present the show in a more refined way to potential investors. Back in the day when writers did backers auditions, you would have just a composer sitting at a piano playing through what was going on and maybe you would have some people just casually reading. 
these days it's a much more polished experience, which I actually think can be challenging because you start to create a different product than what you're actually making. Remember, a musical is meant to be produced on stage. It is meant to be performed by actors in space. And when you start to take away the elements that define that space, you start to create something different. That's a separate conversation though, just a little bit of a tidbit on how that works. So different kinds of workshops that you might involve and that you might start to do. You can incorporate additional musicians. A lot of musicals these days involve music that's more rhythm driven, things that are written by writers who, for example, come from the rock or popular music world. And you might feel that it's important to have a drummer, a guitarist, a bassist with you in the room. So you might incorporate those musicians. It might also just make the products more refined. You might actually start to incorporate dance into the process. So whatever the show needs to start to come into life, you incorporate at a workshop phase. These days I have heard of workshops that are so long and involve so many production elements like fake sets that it almost seems like a full production without a paying audience. I have not done a workshop like that. The longest workshop I think I've ever done was five weeks and that was a lot of dance development. So from those workshops and readings, you get to a point where the show is ready to be produced and you do a first production. You rehearse with the actors to get it ready to go on stage. You go into tech where you add all the technical elements and then you have a preview process where for a few weeks, you're performing at night and you're making changes during the day. If we're thinking about the lifespan of a musical, the first preview is when the musical is born, when it comes out of the womb. And that's because, as I said, a musical is meant to be produced and performed on stage. So everything you've been doing leading up to that, all those readings and workshops and rehearsals, we're setting up what the final product might look like. And until you really see it with set, with lights, with costumes, with the actors in space, with an audience there with you, the musical isn't alive yet. So you learn a lot from that very first experience of getting the show in front of an audience. And that's why we have the preview process, to be able to make changes once you've seen what the show is. Sometimes, a show is ready to just move on right after that, but usually a little further work is needed. Sometimes that means an additional workshop or a reading. Sometimes it just means a little time for the writer to work. And then a show might move on to future productions, which doesn't include Broadway for everything. Not every show is meant to go to Broadway and not every show makes it to Broadway, whether it's meant to go there or not. But the ones that do, a good like basic structure would be you do an out of town tryout or an off Broadway production one first production and then the next place you get to is Broadway. I think that's everybody's dream. The average timeline for this, I would say is about three to five years. And that isn't from the first idea to the Broadway production. That's from maybe the first reading to a Broadway production. It takes a long time for musicals to be born and the writing that a writer has to do in advance of that first reading might take them a number of years depending on the project. So today I wanna to focus in on two sequences from shows that I have worked on that have evolved over time so you can see a little bit into the process of making the decisions I was talking about. To give a quick overview of my experience on Tootsie, the project existed before I joined. I came on board in January 2017 with a new writer and over the course of the next year and a half we did five developmental processes which is a lot. That is unusual for musicals from my experience. We did three readings and two workshops. The workshops being larger presentations where we had more musicians and we presented it to potential investors. The readings were much more casual, the most casual readings I've ever done, where we learned the music, but really it was just the creatives in the room listening and taking notes. So then after that year and a half of development, we went to Chicago to do an out of town tryout at a theater there. And then by the time we opened, we already had a Broadway theater booked for the next spring. And we didn't do any specific developmental work in between. We had conversations as a creative team, but we didn't do any further dance labs. So the sequence I wanna focus on today is called, I like what she's doing. For those of you who don't know the story, if you know the movie, it's about the movie Tootsie from the eighties, um, stars Dustin Hoffman as an out of work actor who can't get a job because he has a reputation of being hard to work with. And he dresses as a woman and gets cast in a soap opera and ends up finding a lot of success, but also gets into a lot of difficult situations because he's pretending to be someone of a different gender. And over the course of being Dorothy Michaels, the actor Michael Dorsey becomes a better person. The musical is a similar story, but instead of a soap opera, he's in a musical. 
And this sequence, I like what she's doing, is the moment when Dorothy Michaels is in rehearsal for this bad musical and says it needs to be better. And over the course of the sequence, the show evolves. We go from the rehearsal room to a production and we see that not only has the show gotten better, but Dorothy's character, which was a small character before, has really become the star of the show. So what was it like to create that sequence? It began with a score. When David Yazbek writes a new song, he doesn't write a score. He records a demo where he sings and he plays piano and sometimes records additional instruments. When I came on to Tootsie, the scores had already been transcribed for much of the material because I was not the original music director. There were creative teams that preceded me. So this is the first score that I saw. I'm just going to play a little bit of the song so we can get this first exposure I would have had into our heads. So, it goes like this. I like what she's doing. It's fresh and it's new. I like how she's giving us her point of view. When she sings that song, she's sweet but she's strong. I like what she's doing. She's got something special that makes you engage. It's almost electric when she hits the stage. Page turn, page, and I can't explain it. She's taking this turkey and making it work, and I can't tell you how. You're right. I hope she keeps doing what she's doing now. And then there's this moment of transition. about what we're hearing there. The original demo that David Yazbek made was built with a script sequence. So he had this theme, but it needed to tell a story throughout the whole song. And we need to take this particular verse and then through the scenes that happen in between it, show that Dorothy is helping the show get better, the show is getting better, people are liking it, and Dorothy's part is getting bigger. In this original text, which you can see these lines here. This is not a version of the show I ever worked on. You can see Ron, the director, having some notes. Here's a fan. There's all sorts of stuff that might have come up. And let's just look at the end for one second, just like not a little bit later. So by the end of the sequence, the lyrics have changed. Let's pick up right here at measure 88. So we're in a new key. And it goes like this. We were dead in the water. We seemed to be stuck. But she's doing something that makes it not suck. We should be on our knees, thanking God for our luck. This lightning has struck and the show's taking flight. Lord, please, I hope she keeps doing what she did tonight. Every night. Removing our tears, relieving our fears. And when the smoke clears, we'll still have careers. So what's not to like? I like what she's doing. So that's how the sequence ended in this very first draft I saw. The first thing that happened when I joined the production is that we started to make changes to the sequence. So who's singing where, why they're singing, what the scenes are in between, and what those transition moments in between meant. And that changed every workshop, and it changed multiple times during each workshop. I have more drafts of this song than I have of any other song in the whole show. Partly because when we would change who sang a song, often that would mean the key would need to change. You can hear in my voice when I sing that melody, it's a little too low for me. That's a good key for David Yazbek. Not a great key for most women. And that first line was sung by Rita, the producer. So the first version that I got to work on more closely, it became higher. I like what she's doing. It's fresh and it's new. I like how she's giving us her point of view which is still a little low for me, but it was right for our actor. But as we changed the sequence, different people were singing different lines, and I had to change the keys all the time, and that meant the transitions in between had to change, because it has to sound smooth as you go from one key to the next, as you go from one section to the next. So, making all those edits led me to the next draft of the show that I would like to present to you, which we will do. So let's share my screen right here. And take a look at this version. 
So this is the last version that I made before we did a dance lab, which I will talk about in a minute. So I have done, this was March, 2018. We've done three workshops at this point, and this would have been the fourth. So take a look at the beginning. We're higher now, and the line is different, and Rita begins by speaking. I like what she's doing. This might be a thing. Let's talk about that speaking for one second. In the first version I had, it began with a tune, but that's not actually practical to do unless you give someone a pitch. And what we found was we didn't want to begin this moment with a pitch, because that tells you as a an audience member, a song is coming on, and we wanted it to feel more organic. And if you're going to make it feel more organic, you can't give an actor a pitch in advance, which means they don't know where to begin singing. So the actor would say, I like what she's doing. This might be a thing. She's giving it feeling, and then she's singing there. So let's look at that transition music. Still pretty consistent, but what's happening afterward begins to change because the scenes start to change. So we still have this sort of tension building music. And then we added something here, which goes back to the vibe of the rest of the song, but changes key. I like what she's doing, and it goes on. So at this point, we have this section of the song here on page five, where in this particular presentation, we had a stage direction reader, and we get to the end of this verse. But honey, I hope she keeps doing what she's doing now. We want it to be something sort of swing feeling, and we say time passes. Dorothy continues to improve the show, changing costumes, fixing sets, adjusting choreography. It is now five minutes before the first performance. So, I'm still playing music, and then we've got a new scene. So, this is an interesting moment. This is the kind of moment that gets made in workshops. We know as a creative team that in this moment in the song, we want Dorothy to be changing the show, but we don't know what it's gonna look like yet. At this phase of development, we've got actors standing in front of music stands and me at a piano with three musicians around me playing drums, bass, and oh, I think that might have actually been it, just the two additional musicians playing drums and bass along with me playing piano. We don't need to flesh out the details. I can have these slashes on the page because I, Andrea, am sitting at the piano, sort of making up this little swing music. I don't need to write it out more specifically because I'm the only person playing. So I'm just giving some idea. But then we get to the phase where we say, okay, we're going into production. How are we actually going to achieve this? If Dorothy's gonna continue to improve the show, what is that actually going to look like? And that takes us to our dance lab. And I want to talk a little bit about what happens in a dance lab, because as a musician, as a music director specifically, I often find that people don't recognize the extent of what happens on a music team for a musical. So let's talk a little bit about what the different arrangers and orchestrators do. Composers write the music, we know this. A music director realizes the composer's vision in people's voices and often has more opinion. But what are arrangers? A dance arranger creates dance sequences in a show. And as you will see, the extent of the writing that a dance arranger does is very extensive. You'd be really surprised to hear an original demo of a song and then see how much the dance arranger really just made up from their own ideas. And the dance arranger works in concert with the choreographer. I've said dance lab a couple times. Workshops with the full script are one way of developing a show, but choreographers need time with dancers to see ideas, to work them over the course of time. So most shows that involve a lot of dance have specific workshops for dance called Dance Labs, but they have several weeks where the choreographer can just play freely because that's how choreographers work, with bodies in space. So vocal arrangements are what people are singing when. And a lot of times if you have a solo, what people are singing when is pretty clear. You've got one voice they're singing the melody that the composer has written. But if you have a show that has a lot of ensemble voices, what the ensemble voices are singing, some composers like to choose and some do not. Whether they like to choose it or not, sometimes it has to change over the course of the show. In the context of Tootsie, I was the vocal arranger. David Yazbek and I have a great working relationship where he can have an idea and then I can play around with it. And then he'll give me feedback and we collaborate together on how things are going. Incidental arranger. Incidental arrangements are the things that happen 
in between songs. So you see a show, the song is done, but then the set is still moving, there's a playoff perhaps. The incidental arranger makes that music. And then perhaps you have two scenes that have spoken words in them. You have to get from one to the other and you want that music to mean something. The incidental arranger is doing that. I wanna mention orchestrators here. The orchestrator is not making the structure of the piece. The orchestrator is filling in the structure of the piece. So David Chase, the brilliant dance arranger who worked on Tootsie among many, many other shows that I'm sure we all know and love, has this beautiful analogy. He imagines that a composer says, I imagine a tree. And some composers will just leave it at that. And some composers will say, I imagine a birch tree on a hill at sunset in summer, the grass is green, the leaves are green, and the sky is blue, and there's a bird in the sky. Some composers will give you a very fleshed out piece of original music and others will give you very little information. The arranger sketches in the drawing of the tree. So you have an idea, but then the arranger puts in the specifics of what the shape of the leaves are on the page and where things are in the frame. The orchestrator colors it in. So the arranger is making the structure and the orchestrator is filling in the colors. So the phase of development we're at now with Tootsie where I just showed you a place that we had reached at a workshop and we hadn't gotten to a dance lab, we're still at the structural phase. We haven't built anything yet that we feel confident giving to the orchestrator and saying, add these colors, because there are so many questions still to be answered. So let's take a look at how the process evolved. We're going to share a new score. We're going to start with the sequence I was just showing you. Here it is on my computer right there. All right, so that dance sequence that we were talking about, where it was sort of swing feeling, and I was just sort of playing. We're saying Dorothy changes the show. How do we actually do that? Well, we ended up adding some text to it, having Dorothy go to the producer and say, I'm thinking about some new ideas, and we loved it. So, then we had a big costume reveal. The women are dressed in Renaissance costumes, they spin around, they are revealed in 1950s costumes. And the choreographer created a sequence where the women's costumes were revealed, and then they danced. Through movement, they showed that they liked it, time was passing. We're telling the story through dance in the same way that we tell the story through music. Then, over the course of time, the men show up and we begin to rebuild their outfits. So let's see what that sounds like. So, first off, we've got this intro, which sounds a lot like that transition I played you before. He's talking, and then we introduce a new idea. 50s. Fellini. Fabulous. That's introducing the idea Rita says, Dorothy, I love it. And then the women come out in their old costumes. And they're revealed to be in new costumes that look beautiful. And then here's what the swing part actually sounds like on a piano. Like this style. This is a hundred percent the dance arranger's work. He took this theme and he said, okay, we've got this idea of swing. We're thinking about a big musical theater moment where we're celebrating, and this is the style we're gonna go for. And David Chase, who is a complete genius, makes this beautiful arrangement. And then at the end of it, you heard this moment where it kept going. So well there, but there it is. And that tells us something new is coming. Again, being completely created by the dance arranger, seeing the choreographer doing this dance with the women and saying, okay, I've danced enough with them. And now through this kind of movement, I want to incorporate the men. So they show up and then we reveal each costume once at a time. And then they all dance together. And then a 
another thing happens. So again, this theme that we're playing with, it's building on that same thing that we're just listening to. And then we transition from rehearsal to the stage. So I mentioned early on that we need to take the show from the rehearsal where Dorothy begins this idea to a fully conceived performance. And in this moment, the set transitions. When you get there with that big hit, the lights come up on the actors, they've been spinning, the set's been moving, and now we see we're in a new space. That moment was the idea of the choreographer and the dance arranger having the actors spinning, but it was made in concert with the director and the set designer who said, if we're going to have this moment where we're going to transition, it has to be possible for our set to make some sort of transformation to show this moment. This whole sequence required such collaboration between every single member of the team, not just the writers, the arranger, the choreographer, the director, each designer, especially the costume designer, this is a very costume heavy show, those reveals needed to be possible and they needed to be spectacular so that we would all get excited about them. And then we get to the end of this sequence and we can continue on with the story knowing that the dance has gotten us somewhere. I want to talk about one other part of the I like what she's doing sequence. And that was a very movement focused section, but there's another section of the song that was quite specifically focused on vocals as well, not just to make the action move along, but to make it feel big enough for a big musical. So we're gonna go back to this draft that I had shown you at the very beginning, the first version that I saw, I showed you the end. Let's take a look at it again. Screen. Here it is. So we looked at this end. The chorus is singing this last chorus. We were dead in the water. We seem to be stuck. They're singing. Rita shows up. Dorothy is not in this moment at all. And what we ended up determining was that Dorothy needed to be the star of the end of the song. We needed to see that Dorothy had become the focus of the show. And if everybody else is singing, we're not with Dorothy. She's the center of attention in this song. The other thing we felt was that this sequence was not spectacular enough. It needed to end with a bigger um because it was becoming this big, long sequence. I showed you that whole big dance section. This is a big moment in the show. It needs to have a big enough ending to support it. Over the course of a workshop, we made a draft of that that was fine. It was the right idea to begin with. And here is what that looked like. So we get to this end sequence. There's a song earlier in the show called I Won't Let You Down, where Dorothy auditions for the show and is very successful. So it's a song we've heard Dorothy sing. So we decided to add that back into this moment. And I did a vocal arrangement for this workshop because there is no dance arranging at this workshop stage. We don't have any movement yet. It's just me and the actors. So I added this song. <laughs> I won't let you down because you believe in me because you're the one who can see. You notice the ensemble is singing. If you look at the score, you can see it. I'm here and alive. You can see all these places where me playing alone. I didn't write anything more specific. I won't let you down because when I felt empty inside, you filled up my cup, you lifted me up. I won't let you down. And then the ensemble comes in. We were dead in the water. We seem to be stuck. So now Dorothy has made a presence, made an appearance, sounded fantastic. The ensemble has come with her. And then we get back into the chorus of the song. We get to the end. They carry through just as it ended before. Lord, please, I hope she keeps doing what she's doing right. Dorothy's still singing around that every night, removing our tears, relieving our fears. When the smoke clears, we'll still have premieres. So what's not to like? Dorothy reappears. I like what she's doing. Make it longer. I won't let you down. Made it a little bit longer. Good start. Not enough, though. We needed more. So when we got into our dance lab and started working on this sequence, we fleshed it out even further. 
we made a big build because we added a set transition and we wanted to incorporate dance to reveal Dorothy in her fantastic new costume. So. I won't let you down. So again, the dance arranger is making this up. Together we had the idea of the Oz, and I wrote that, but the dance arranger is making the sequence where everybody is moving, and then Dorothy is singing. We've changed the, the arrangement, you remember? I just played this, which seemed exciting enough to show something was gonna be there, but now our dance arranger has written. It's more exciting. Then we get to this chorus, which I showed you we were dead in the water, the ensemble is there. I've written some more vocal arrangements where it gets flushed out. So we get to this point where we said, Dorothy was not being featured enough and was not being featured appropriately. This show is an unusual show in that our lead actor did some very interesting vocal calisthenics to play Dorothy Michaels because it was a male actor trying to impersonate a female singer. So we had to make very specific vocal choices to match what he was doing. So we have this moment where we say we want Dorothy to be more present and to be more featured vocally. So we added this moment and this show is taking flight. I filled up my cup, I never gave up, and now I can soar to the heavens and higher, Lord please. So Dorothy has this big note where we're like, wow, Dorothy's great. And that helps us tell the story that Dorothy is really spectacular here. Then at the end of the sequence, instead of just rushing to the end, removing our tears, relieving our fears, and when the smoke clears, We'll still have her here, so what's not to like me? Extend this big. This part where you're building up to the end. I give you my word, and Dorothy again is telling the story. I won't let you. Not at the end yet. Dorothy goes down. So here at this moment, down. Dorothy is the feature. Before I had, I won't let you down a little bit at the end but it wasn't a whole sequence about Dorothy. And this particular key was chosen for this particular actor, and these chords were chosen to suit the, the notes that worked for our actor in this instance. And then we end, with a big end. So that whole sequence, all those little moments that we added, helped make this big number that's very long feel like it really reached an end. So let's take a look now at what this sounds like at the very end, when you get to the cast album stage. So I'm gonna show you what this looked like on Broadway, and we're gonna follow along and be able to appreciate that. So here is the- Hey, I hope she keeps doing what she's doing now. Rita, oh, forget the Renaissance. I'm thinking all new well, costumes. 50s. Fellini. Fabulous. Jonathan, I love it. whether there are any moments that got orchestrated in a way that sounds different from what you might have imagined. You heard me playing it on the piano, everything else that was created, all of those instrumental parts, the orchestrator chose and it was inspired by what the dance arranger wrote and the structure, which notes were where, what the chords were, where the hits were, was determined by the arranger. But the orchestrator made the choices of who played what and how it became realized to sound like a big band, which is the orchestra that we had. So let's now look at that final sequence at the end where you can appreciate how Dorothy really keeps focus at the end of the song. And now anybody can 
feels satisfying enough to you to make Dorothy the focus and to celebrate everybody else in that moment. Okay, so now let's move onward. Let's talk a little bit about the band's visit. Very different process than Tootsie. The process I've talked you through with I like what she's doing was a complicated sequence in a very traditional musical. The band's visit is not a traditional musical. And what do I mean by a traditional musical? That's definitely a much larger topic. It can certainly be its own lecture. But I would say what I mean in a lot of ways is that you've got principal characters and an ensemble. You've got numbers that grow in these ways where you have a big ending. The band's visit is more like a play. If you don't know the show or the movie, the story of the band's visit is an Egyptian band of musicians who come to Israel to play a concert. They end up on the wrong bus. Or, yeah, they end up on the wrong bus and they get stuck in this tiny town in the middle of the desert and they're stuck there for the night and the locals take them in. And over the course of the evening, everybody's lives are subtly transformed. And the musical features the musicians in the Egyptian band in a very direct storytelling way. So just having an arranger and an orchestrator isn't right for the show when each musician on stage is a voice in the show. So the experience of writing it was much more collaborative and generative with the musicians themselves who were playing. We all participated in the writing process in a way that is unique to a lot of musicals. I feel that my personal stamp is a much larger part of the band's visit than it is in other shows I have done because of the way the show was developed. So let's look at how a song was developed in the course of the band's visit. Similar kinds of questions, but different ways of getting to the answer. So we're going to start one, let me take you to the song called The Beat of Your Heart. This is a song sung by a character who's at a dinner party, and no one is really talking very much, but they find that they bond over music. You know, over the course of this song, it goes from not a very good dinner party to a very celebratory occasion where everybody has connected. And it's the first time we see that kind of connection in the show. So just to give you a sense of what this song sounds like, this is the very beginning of this chorus. Love starts on a downbeat. Love starts when the music starts. Love starts when the tune is sweet. And you lift your feet to the beat of your heart. Love makes a rhythm. Love dances in a dance. It moves when you start to move and watches the groove, the beat of your heart. So this very basic way that I'm playing it for you is pretty much how it would have been presented the first time. I transcribed these scores. This is pretty much my first draft of the song. I had a demo from David Yazak where he was singing, he was playing piano, and he had a couple other instruments in there. And that was it. And I wrote down the notes on the page. So the part that I want to focus on today is this middle section. Yazbek is a songwriter who has his own band, and a lot of times when he drafts songs, he writes the main part of the song, the song form, and then includes an instrumental middle section because he's an improviser, he likes to improvise, and he likes his musicians to improvise. So this moment in the song not only features that, but it also makes dramatic sense. The song is called The Beat of Your Heart. They're at a dinner party, and he had this idea that the actors on stage would play percussion. They would hit the instruments in the room, and that would be how the party would grow. The beat of your heart would be the beat that the musicians were actually playing because everybody in the scene was a musician. 
So we get to this moment here at the end of this last verse. There goes the kick drum, spelling out the rhythm of love, telling you get off your seat and move your feet, and dance on the beat of your heart. And then there'd be a solo, maybe a clarinet solo, or someone playing a solo. And then we're dancing in some way, and he doesn't know how we're dancing yet. It's just an idea, leaving space for the possibility that another creative might fill. And then we get to the percussion section. And again, on this original demo, it's fleshed out in some way, but it isn't specifically storytelling yet. It's saying, here's the kind of thing we could put in this space, and it was a long soul. And you get to the end, and then Aubrey goes, and if you play me summertime, and the story continues. So how did we take that sequence into the version that we ended up having in our first production off Broadway? Well, the first thing that we discovered is that the dreams of having our actors play percussion at that level were too far-fetched. Not all of the actors in this scene were actual musicians, and having a set of actors playing that kind of intricate rhythm on stage was not going to be effective. We also didn't have the right kinds of sounds. We didn't have the right kinds of implements to be able to make sound. We were saying they're in this living room. How are they in this dining room? Because they're at dinner. How are they going to make sound? Hitting their plates, using spoons. The things that were on the table in this Israeli dining room were not the right things to make sound. We couldn't figure out something that really matched the original vision. What we did have was one real actor musician in that scene who truly could play his instrument at a virtuosic level. And what we wanted to do was feature him. And he's a violinist. So what we ended up doing with that sequence that I showed you was after Auburn goes, telling you get off your seat and move your feet and dance to the beat of your heart. We had a little bit of rhythm where they were just hitting the table like this. And in this time, this violinist is pulling out his violin and he starts to play. <laughs> is playing, we're using the musician we actually had in the production of the band's visit off Broadway. And the sequence ended there. We had considered having a longer sequence in the middle, as had been in the original version I played you, where we included other actors, where we showed other people throughout the town getting ready, and what we found was we were never able to make that as exciting as this moment in the dining room with this particular musician, this particular actor playing this music. But when we took the show from off-Broadway to Broadway, we felt that this moment wasn't 100% right because the violin, when it comes in, I showed you, is at the same level as the rest of the song. The violinist must be very excited to be able to play this. This is a very upbeat melody. And that particular character wasn't the most upbeat character. He's kind of a curmudgeon. He also has a nuanced Arabic music voice. And we see that later in the show. And this particular actor is really an expert in Arabic music. So we wanted to honor that in a different way. So we considered some other options. And together as a group, we evolved a new sequence, which sounded something like this thing I'm going to show you. But let me share my screen for you now. Here it is. So, dance to the beat of your heart. We do the same hitting thing. But now, because we don't need to build time for the melody to come in, before the violinist played the melody, but now he's going to play something new. So we had more music we were able to use. Instead of having our actors hit the piano for so long, dance to the beat of your heart. They hit the table for a minute. And then the clarinet somewhere else, the band comes in, and everyone is dancing. The violinist is pulling out his violin, and he played this beautiful thing.
So this is my fake version of it on the piano. George Abud, our actor, actually wrote this solo himself. It captures what the character was going for in a much more beautiful way. Let me play this with this for you now, as it was actually played on our cast album. There goes the kick drum, spelling out the rhythm of love. Telling you get off your seat and move your feet and that's to the beat of your heart. So, you can't hear it in the cast album, but they're putting the table. And if you play me summertime. What you get out of this version that you didn't get out of the upbeat version we have on Broadway is a more nuanced perspective on what's going on in this moment. It's not all joyful. And that makes sense because part of what the song is about is about this man remembering meeting his wife who has since passed away. But the whole show is also about this deeper sense of longing and beauty. So that was one sequence from the band's visit. Oh, I actually, I meant to say, the fun thing about this is that that's how it ended up on Broadway. When we took the show on tour, the actor musician playing that role was no longer a violinist, he was a percussionist. So we ended up beginning that section with a percussion solo, but the violin solo had become so much a part of the moment that we incorporated our other violinist, who was still a musician in the show, to play that moment elsewhere. The violin had ended up taking on other meaning because this character who was singing the song, his wife who had passed away, played the violin. No, that is not true. That's a lie. He played the violin. So we're hearing this violin music and it sort of connects with him and they have a connection there. But the percussion that we had originally begun this idea with, the idea of someone playing an actual percussion instrument on stage, meant something new now. It still worked with the beat of your heart, but the violin had become something new. So over the course of the development of the show, we found meaning within the sequence that had never existed there before. I want to talk about one more sequence, which is the part. And I'm not going to show a score for this because the score doesn't capture what the experience was of building the sequence. When we created the show, I told you we had onstage musicians who ran on and off stage actually from the pit to the stage. They were presences on the stage, but they were also members of my orchestra. And we didn't have an onstage percussionist when we did the show off Broadway, which looking back now that I know David Yasek better, I would never have let that happen because I appreciate how much rhythm matters to him. Also knowing more about Eric Smith's music, I appreciate that we couldn't have represented the Arabic music well enough on stage without having a percussionist. So at the time we did not have one and we were in the room at rehearsal saying what can we do with our musicians that sounds beautiful but doesn't rely on rhythm since we can't use the rhythm on stage in the way we want to. And we had a musician who played the alto flute, a reed player, and we said what can we do with the alto flute? Let's take a listen. Just explore. We found these beautiful things. And this was a cast album, so this was the final version. And then we said, what can we add to this? We decided to add the cello. And the experience of making this was we were in the room and David Yazbek said, let's add the cello here. And then what if this instrument does this thing? And what if this instrument does this thing? And we created all these lovely sounds and we said, this is beautiful. We should do something with it. We should put it in this scene. And then we had a scene in the show where the two main characters of the show, the director of the orchestra, two feet, and Dina, this woman in town who's really taken them in, have gone out and they're sitting on a bench. And Dina is imagining that it's a park. In the course of the scene, Dina and Tufik develop a bond. Tufik reveals some things about his life. He talks about conducting an orchestra. And at the end, he reveals that he sings. And he sings for Dina. And that becomes the next song of the show. So we said, this is a great opportunity to use music. But we weren't sure where or how we were going to use it. We had this beautiful texture, but we weren't sure where it belonged. 
And we tried different things. We said we could underscore the whole scene, but the scene is very long, it's seven or eight minutes. That's a long time for underscoring that doesn't go very far. You needed to move somewhere with the scene. And that didn't feel like the right gesture anyway, because we wanted the words to speak for themselves. So maybe it would go at the end, because you were going into a song and it would lead in. We couldn't figure out how to make that work either. So we tried it at the beginning, and we said, if we put it at the beginning, it has to end somewhere. Where does it end? And I mentioned that there's a point in the scene where Tufi talks about conducting an orchestra. Dina says to him, what does it feel like? And he raises his arms and conducts. And in the movie and in the script, he just starts to conduct. But in rehearsal, we were playing around with him sort of lifting his arms to get ready. And I asked the conductor in the room was saying, this isn't really what you would do as a conductor, but this isn't actually a conducting sequence. This is a musical. So he raises his arms, he played around with his gesture, and then he did a big downbeat. For anyone who has seen a conductor, you know that a downbeat is when the music begins. And that gave us our answer. We tried having the music build as he was raising his arms. And then when he dropped his arms, the music went out. It ended up sounding like this. Ooh, and you know. Wow. That's um Yes, what? I ended up feeling that this was the most important moment of the show. It didn't exist until we talked about playing the music without rhythm on stage and exploring these ideas. And over the course of the exploring that music building, that was a decision we all made together, the way it built, the musicians were coming up with, I was coming up with, Jacob was coming up with. Really every bit of that, if you look at the final score now, all these little decisions that you're told to do, we all chose together over the course of developing that moment. So these are two different stories from two very different musicals with the same composer. And people often ask me what makes those shows different as if the composer is the determining factor. And absolutely a composer has some things in common from one show to the other. Both of these shows began with their music in demo form because Yazbek writes by playing and performing. So the music had to be transcribed. Not all composers work that way. A lot of them write their music down. What else do they have in common? Both shows evolved over the course of some readings and workshops and then had a first production and then moved to Broadway and made some changes at every stage. What else do they have in common? They have a story and the story guides the choices that we make. I find that the things shows have in common are more than the things they have um, that make them different. But the reality is lots of things do make them different because the material that you're working with is very different. Bands visit a much more delicate structure. There are big gestures you would make in Tootsie that would never belong in the band's visit because we're just dealing with a finer material. Perhaps the band's visit is made of silk and Tootsie is made of flannel, something like that. But the process, oh, and Tootsie includes more people. There was no need for dance arrangements specifically in the band's visit because we didn't have dance in the same way. Our choreographer worked with walking and with gestures much more than with creating a sequence for telling the story because the sequences we created for telling the story in the band's visit were more musical or driven by actors and subtle transitions rather than saying we need to add this moment and we need to make it something larger. So we need someone who knows how to build from scratch in that way. What takeaways do we have? from what we've talked about today. If there's something I wanna leave you with, it's that it takes a village to make a musical. I've shown you a couple sequences that we've built from bit to bit up to something full. And I hope that you can see from the many decisions that we made, how what you hear in a cast album, what you see in a final script and score was decided intentionally by several members of the creative team working together. I also want this to end with you knowing that theater is a living art form. And what that means is that these choices are not necessarily final. Perhaps a show has grown up, but when we all got to the point where we were grown up, we kept maturing, we kept growing, 
And when a piece of theater is alive, the, sh the choices can keep changing. The band's visit tour changed it. A show that might have a new revival that makes different choices. You might have people who make different choices that highlight the story in a new way. All of these fundamental decisions are there to be played with. And if you're working at a community theater where you don't have the rights to do that, it might not happen so much, but at the level where you're talking to the writers and the people who created the show, that potential is always there. And even in a production where you're not changing the text, each production highlights something new in the show because each of those choices is still intentional. So I hope that when you go to see shows now, you can appreciate the thought and care that went into each piece as it was built. And you can question a little bit why those choices were made and whether if you had your opportunity, you would consider making different choices. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to talking to you about your thoughts. On the Clock is part of our larger series, Digital Clock. Digital Clock is made possible by a generous gift from Phil and Liz Gross. If you'd like to learn more about our programming or how you can become a supporter, visit us at collegelightoperacompany.com. Tune in again next week for another installment of On the Clock.